Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for those of you who are here for your first time, welcome. Great to have you here. Go ahead in the comments and say new and tell us a bit about yourself, maybe where you're from. What stage are you? We have a great community here of positive and supportive kidney warriors all working to kick kidney disease to the curb and improve their quality of life. Now, since you are new, some of you, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is James. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a dietitian. I'm just a guy who discovered just over two years ago that I had kidney issues. And let me tell you, I didn't just have kidney issues. I spent a week in the ICU with stage five kidney failure. I had a single digit GFR when I went into the ICU. Now, when I came out, they got me up to GFR 13 and said, James, that's as good as it's gonna get. You need dialysis. Well, I was not ready to change my life and go on dialysis. I wanted a chance to try diet and lifestyle changes from researching on the internet, I saw there may be the way to slow down or improve my kidney health by making diet and lifestyle changes. So I made an agreement with my doctor and then I started working with my entire healthcare team. I got a renal dietitian. I said goodbye to my good friend, Wendy. I said goodbye to the Burger King. I kissed McDonald's goodbye and I started eating healthy. I started exercising. I got my blood pressure under control. I worked with my doctors to do things that were good for my body. And in the end, I was rewarded with better overall health and better kidney function. My GFR and my lab slowly started improving. And after about a year and a half, I was up to stage three, but more importantly, I did not have a single symptom. There's no magic pills, no magic herbs, no magic teas. It was just working with my doctors and with the renal dietitian and living a healthy lifestyle and some luck that allowed me to get to where I am. Now today, with us again, we have Dr. Rosansky, the author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. And if you have not purchased this book yet, oh, you don't know what you are missing. Of all the kidney books out there, and let me tell you something, I have stacks and stacks of them. I think I've purchased practically every single book out there. This is by far the easiest to read, the easiest to understand, and the one that made the most sense. It's not one of those doom and gloom books talking about, hey, your kidney is just gonna keep getting worse and you need to go on dialysis, no. This is written by a guy with over 40 years experience dealing with kidney patients who, you know, the way he wrote this is just unbelievable. It's easy to understand. Now, I'm going to show a link on the screen for those that don't have this book yet where you can go on Amazon. Um, you can also just go to Amazon and search for learn the facts about kidney disease or go to your local bookstore. Ask them if they have or if they can order it in. It's a great book. But now let's get to Dr. Rosansky, also known as Dr. Rowe. Hey, Dr. Rowe, how you doing? I'm good, James. How are you doing? Hey, doing fantastic. And right there next to you is a picture of your book. I'll bring this up whenever people say, hey, what's the name of that book again? <laughs> that way they can all find it. And there's a link, go.dadvicetv.com slash book that will take everybody directly to Amazon where they could purchase this book if they'd like to. And I definitely recommend that. But can you go ahead and introduce yourself for those that are new who haven't seen you here before? Yeah, I'm a kidney doctor. Uh, I actually went to med school in 68 to 72, so you can figure out uh, just about how old I am. <laughs> and um, I was really interested in kidney disease because it was the one thing, if you didn't want to be a surgeon, where you could really do something. That was the beginning of dialysis and transplantation. So I was there the whole, the whole way of that business. I've done a good bit of my own clinical research. I've got over 100 publications. I've taken care of thousands of patients and um, started a kidney program in the University of South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, and the VA, Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, I discovered James, and I'm really thankful to have the opportunity to talk about kidney disease 
And a special topic today, which is extremely timely, talk about COVID today. Yes, yes, which yes. I think we are all, all worried and wondering about, and I will try to answer any questions I can for you and give you the straight scoop. All right, COVID. looking forward to it, because COVID is definitely something that's on the mind of everyone with kidney disease. And also those that have, who have received a transplant, I get a lot of questions that I can't answer. So it's great to have an expert like you here, someone who you know, is a real doctor who can talk about these things from a more professional point of view. So I guess we should start out by uh, reiterating uh, the fact that we are in the most dangerous phase of this pandemic. COVID is a worldwide virus, and I can't imagine anyone, unless you've been living under a rock, who hasn't heard about just how serious this virus is, especially in the USA. And it will get worse as we go into the next few months. So literally, what I am going to talk to you about tonight may save your life. And I think you need to all be taking this very seriously. So let's just start out by talking about what is COVID? What is this virus? Well, it's just a, another cold virus, but a nasty cold virus. Your cold virus is a coronavirus. This is a corona, not the corona beer, but the coronavirus. <laughs> and we all would just like to drink corona beer and not have to worry about coronavirus, but unfortunately we all have to take this very, very seriously. Every mm -hmm. single person on the planet and especially in the U.S. and in Europe right now, where this is raging. Yeah. So the first thing to know is that this is an extremely infectious virus. And the other thing to know is that it is transmitted by airborne transmission. <clears throat> so what does that mean? As I'm talking to you, there are particles coming out of my mouth. Those particles are droplets. Those droplets, if I had virus in me, in my lungs, I would be transmitting droplets with virus to anyone who is in front of me, let's say less than six feet away. And um, that's the reason why we need to mask up. Masking is not a political statement. It should never have been a political statement Masking can save your life, and it can save your loved one's life, and it can save people around you, their lives too. And there's a lot of science to this masking, and I'm going to get into this a little bit. So what happens if, if James is in front of me, and James has a mask on, and I have a mask on? So let's just think about it. This is not rocket science. What's going on here? I've got virus. Let's just say I've got virus. James doesn't. So I put my mask on. Actually, I should have. Well, actually, I've got one right here. I, I have mine, but the problem with mine is okay. it's green. So the green's green. <laughs> okay. Shines this, this, through this, it. <laughs> this is, okay. Okay. This is You've got a real be, one. Yeah. This is called a KN95. Leave the real N95s. To the, to the medical people. But the thing is, this mask goes over, any mask will go over your nose and you attach it to your ears. And so what you want to do is you want to try to occlude, to block those particles coming out, going into James' face. Now, here's the way it works. It's very simple. If I got virus, number one is how much virus do I have? Mm -hmm. The people that are so-called super spreaders, you may have heard that, yep. they've got a lot of virus coming out of them. Boom, boom, boom. You know, they've got millions of these virus particles coming out. So, And I'm guessing have... if they're a loud talker, that probably is expelling even more. Exactly. People that are talking loud, talking with emphasis, people that, that are singing, mm -hmm. especially people that are coughing, people that are sneezing. I mean, anything that gets these particles out is going to create more danger. 
So it's a simple proposition. You don't need a K95. You don't even need a surgical mask. It's been shown that if you have two layers of cloth and you could take one of these cloth masks, they're all over now and they come in all kinds of styles with all kinds of emblems and all kinds of stuff on yep. them. Here's one of my kids, a blue one. <laughs> yeah. Um, two layers is all you need. And they've actually tested how much viral particles will get out with one layer, two layers, or three layers, okay? And mm -hmm. it turns out <clears throat> you just need two layers to block most of the particles. So let's say here I am, I've got all this virus coming out. If I put my mask on, I'm blocking it, and James has his mask on, he's blocking it both ways. So yep. that will not absolutely 100% prevent it, but it will do a lot to prevent you from getting that virus. The masks are a must. They're a must. So yep. don't, yeah, go ahead, James. I was going to say, you know, I know, of, you know, I'm a huge masker. I have all the custom masks that I've made. It's, I wish I could turn the green screen off for this, but it's all green behind me. You know, I've made my own custom mask. One thing, you know, my kids had problems with their mask going in their yeah. mouth yeah. when they would talk. So we actually bought these plastic, they're silicone inserts that most of these masks have a mm -hmm. gap, a, a, like a pocket. These yeah. go in there and it fits comfortably and your mask is now all the layers are all here and it helps it be tighter on the edge, which right. is great. And these things are like a quarter each. They're so cheap and they have kid sizes and adult sizes. So okay, for those that are out there that are saying, hey, I don't wanna wear a mask because it's hard to talk or it goes in my mouth and you have a cloth mask. These things are on Amazon. You can buy them in bulk, great. Don't do this. Useless, cover your nose. So many people I see do this, oh. it's pointless. You gotta cover your nose and, and try to, if you can, seal it as much as you can around mm -hmm. your face. So masks are absolutely essential. The other reason why masks are essential, besides the fact that this is a droplet infection and just let me kind of go quickly over the, the issue of people get obsessed with, I got to wipe everything. I got to get these, these wipes and I got a very, very little transmission from touching, but I carry my hand sanitizer around. I, I recommend you keep your little hand sanitizer around. So when you've been out somewhere touching stuff, just get your hand sanitizer. But the best thing is washing your hands thoroughly with two happy birthday songs, saying it twice and, and get in, into your fingers and, and, and just go like that and go like that and just really wash them really good. No gloves, gloves are pointless. Wash your hands, okay. So here's the, one of the biggest problems with this virus, asymptomatic transmission. Mm -hmm. You'll go around and at least half the people <clears throat> that have got the infection, maybe even more, that have been infected with COVID, have no symptoms. So you will not know if, if well-meaning people that wanna to get together with you for the holidays, whether they have COVID or not. And that's why the CDC has recommended to not get together this year with family. You wanna be alive next year. The vaccine is here. It's worth the wait. Everyone in your family wants you to be alive for next year's Thanksgiving and Christmas. So just try to um, do the holidays in your own home by yourself. Do it on your FaceTime, do it on Zoom or what you, whatever you can. But try not to gather in groups because a lot of COVID is out there and a lot of the people that may have it, including kids coming back from college and uh, they, they're probably mostly going to be asymptomatic and you're not going to know who's got it and who doesn't have it. So, um, you know, you, you should try to avoid going into groups, try to avoid going into closed spaces. Mm -hmm. Uh, you got to go shopping and we're going to get into risk. If you are one of the people at risk and every one of you who has CKD, I've got some bad news. You are at a higher risk than probably most other people. You're at a higher risk 
than the diabetics, than the hypertensives, than even people with lung disease. It turns out that CKD is a very high risk group of people. <clears throat> and if you've got a lower kidney function number, you're even at a higher risk. And we're not just talking about higher risk of getting the sniffles, we're talking about a higher risk of getting hospitalized and potentially dying. This is very, very serious stuff. And your family and friends want you to be around next year, so take this to heart. Yeah, um, and, and we've been isolating for the most part since March. Uh, we pretty much stick with just our family. We're going to do FaceTime with our relatives for, for the holidays coming up. We spent Thanksgiving here, made our own little dinner. It was a, uh -huh. a it was an okay dinner, no turkey or anything <laughs> like that. Because we, we tried to be kidney friendly, super healthy, very green, but it, it, it was enjoyable and none of us have gotten sick. And our kids, you know, I have two kids, they both do virtual school. They, they do have a couple kids in the neighborhood they play with, but those are also ones that are isolating and are in virtual. But we, we stopped that after Thanksgiving. The numbers just got so bad. We're like, yeah, we're not even going to do that. We're gonna stay here until we get our vaccines and they get their vaccines. It's only gonna be a handful of months at the most. It, it, it's worth it. Okay, we're gonna get into vaccine a, a, a little bit later. But let me just um, talk about um, what you should avoid in terms of catching the virus. You want to try to avoid crowds. I know people like to go to their synagogues and churches, but unfortunately, especially with the singing, uh, they could be places where you're gonna get the virus. The safest place, and you can get out of your house. I know people are, are get coronavirus fatigue. We're, we're tired of isolating. We don't wanna stay in our homes. We wanna hug people. We want to get back to things, you know, to our families. I want to see my grandkids. I, <laughs> I mean, everybody has the same desires, but we have to just be patient because the end is near. I would say by next summer, most of us should have the vaccine available. We'll talk about who's going to get the vaccine in a little bit in terms of the sequence of who gets it first. Um, so. You should know that outdoor activities are good for your mental and physical health. And as I've talked about, and I mentioned in my book, if you've got kidney disease, you're at a higher risk of arteriosclerosis, of heart disease. And my book recommends things to decrease your risk, including diet and exercise. Exercise, yeah. I think, is the key to mental and physical health, to keep your brain sharp and to keep your body sharp and to give you added years of life. Go out and exercise, outdoors are good. A lot of folks wear their masks outdoors. I think it is, and Dr. Fauci agrees, it is extremely difficult, I wouldn't say impossible because I've heard anecdotes, to get the virus outdoors. Why is that? <clears throat> Well, if you're in a closed space and you're with a lot of people, you got a lot of that virus in there and it could come into your nose and mouth. If you're outdoors, you've got all that air that's gonna dilute the virus. So you have a much lower probability of getting infected. I would say if you wanna to be totally on the safe side, outdoors and masking is okay as well. But I am comfortable having you know, one or two friends visit with me outdoors uh, and that's the best way if you want to do any socializing. Of course, you need heaters, it's getting cold, you need to bundle up, but that's your safest way to do any social interaction is outdoors. Avoid having lots of people in your home, avoid close contact, because that's the most dangerous thing for you in terms of uh, getting the virus, likely to get the virus. So how do you know if you have the virus? And what do you do if you think you have the virus? And this is very important. And some of what I'm gonna tell you may save your life. First of all, obviously if you get a fever, if you, obviously if you get a cough, mm -hmm. and two other weird little things is you have a change in your sense of taste or smell. Um, if you have any of these things, you want to immediately 
self-isolate. Now, what do we mean by self-isolate? That means if you can, and everybody can do this. I realize some people don't have the luxury of having enough space in their homes to easily self-isolate, but you should try to stay in your room, separate from the other folks in the house. You want to wear your mask when you're coming out of your room. You want to try to make sure you do lots of hand washing and try to keep all your stuff separate, your toiletries, the food you eat, your, your utensils and so forth. If you think that you have been exposed, the way you save the rest of the folks around you, your friends and family, is to self-isolate. And what, unfortunately, the, uh, the illness has a very varied presentation. You can have GI problems. You could have just fogginess of your mind with a little bit of fever. There's a lot of different ways that COVID can present. The commonest one is cough and fever. If you are unfortunate enough to be one of the folks that gets really sick with a fever and cough, and you're having difficulty breathing, you want to lay on your belly, that's called pronation. That could save your life. What happens if you lay on your belly, the secretions that may be developing in your lungs have more easy access to get out and allow you to get more air into your lungs. So you wanna lay on your belly with your arms like this on your bed, and um, that's called pronation. And if you happen to be unfortunate enough to be having breathing problems, you want to try pronation to help you. That's what they're gonna do for you in the hospital. I know a lot of people are afraid to go to the hospital because you know they think if they don't have it they'll catch it but today's world we know how to protect ourselves the healthcare workers know how to protect ourselves if you are sick and really sick do not um, avoid going into the hospital you don't need to go immediately when you got a little bit of fever but if you start having significant shortness of breath you need to get yourself to the hospital now um, there are things that you can do in addition to masking to protect yourself and your family. You want to try to limit your contacts as far as possible. If you can't limit them, keep them in what they call a bubble. So you have a handful of people, your immediate family members, your kids may be going to school. Maybe you got parents live with you. Maybe you got grandparents live with you. You want to keep everybody safe you want to make sure that everybody's following the rules and you want to stay within your bubble. Don't venture out to socialize in other areas. And that's another way to keep yourself protected. Um, so what kinds of testing uh, can be done uh, if you think that you've been exposed? And if you know of someone that tells you that they've been exposed to the virus, you need to try to get yourself a test. Now, there are antigen tests, there are molecular tests that are called PCR, and then there are antibody tests. Let's get rid of the antibody tests first. Don't waste your money. Unfortunately, there's a lot of companies that put a lot of money into getting these antibody tests. What is an antibody test? The antibody test theoretically tells you if you have been exposed and you developed your own antibodies, which is what the vaccine will do for you, it'll give you the antibodies, uh, and that you may be protected from the virus. The, the antibody test that we have, unfortunately, cannot tell you that you are protected from the virus, and they're not worth doing. The other tests are the so-called PCR test and the antigen test. The PCR test is the gold standard. It's the so-called molecular test. You can do it two ways. You can either get a swab, you can do it yourself, put it in the back of your nose, or someone else will do that. And the other sample could be saliva. And I've actually had a person in our university that had their own saliva test that they uh, produced. And um, those tests, sometimes they're hard to come by, sometimes there's long lines, but that's the diagnostic test. Now here's the thing, are you gonna become positive if you were exposed and how long will it take you to get positive in one of these 
molecular test, the so-called PCR test, it's probably going to take you at least five days. So testing immediately may not have any value. Why is it going to take, you know, could take, it could take less. It could take three or four days or, you know, two or three days. But it depends on how much virus you've got. So what they're going to do is take that little swab and they're going to try to get virus detected out of it. I mean, just think about that. These tiny viruses, and they're going to have to somehow get it off that swab. The more virus you have, the more likely you're going to have a positive test. So if you're going to be sick from the virus, you'll have adequate amount of virus to be tested from your nose or your saliva by around five days. And if you have a negative test, you're probably okay. Uh, but if you have been exposed, to be sure, the latest CDC guidelines were saying that you should isolate, keep away from people for two weeks. They have cut that down. If you've had a negative test, let's say in five days, you could probably, and you haven't had any symptoms by a week, you're probably okay. If you don't want to get tested and you want to be sure you're safe to be exposed to other people, and you have had a person in your circle that has been tested positive for COVID, the 14 days was the original idea. If you haven't gotten sick in 14 days, you're probably fine. But now the CDC realizes that people need to get back to work. We've got to get our economy going. And some people are essential workers. <clears throat> They've cut it back down to 10 days. So if you've had no symptoms, after you've been theoretically exposed to someone who's tested positive, you're probably okay 10 days to be back out doing your thing. Now I have a question about the testing. Sure. Yeah. How much can we trust a negative test? Should we, if we were around someone and we believe we may have been exposed, um, I, I've heard that some tests may not be, you know, they're not a hundred percent accurate. Should we try to get two negatives of, you know, a few days apart before so we kind of realize or, or what, what do you recommend? So let's go back over this three types of tests. And I know this is a little bit complicated. The PCR test, if you're going to get a test, is this a PCR test? Now, apparently there's some PCR tests that are quick tests. I don't quite understand the methodology because it's kind of complex and I don't know how they can do it that quickly, but there are some PCR tests that are, that are quick. You can get them back within hours. Theoretically, I've heard that. I haven't looked into it in detail. So PCR antigen antibody, don't waste your time with antibody tests. Antigen tests are cheaper, they're quicker, but they're not as specific, James. So mm -hmm. if you got a negative antigen test and you really think you've been exposed or you've got symptoms of COVID, you've got to get the PCR test. And again, the PCR test may take days before it'll convert after being exposed. You got to get enough virus in you to yep. get a positive PCR test. So if you really think you've been exposed and you tested like two or three days after your exposure, negative, get another test in five or six days. If it's negative, you're probably okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so um, you should all get your flu shots too. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you are at risk of, and you should probably talk to your doctor about getting the Pneumovi Pneumovax. Because people that are um, now older, that one's new to me. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, yeah. People that so there is a vaccine called the Pneumovax vaccine, and I think it's recommended for people over sixty-five or sixty. I don't know for sure, but that can help prevent pneumococcal pneumonia, which used to be called the old man's friend. A lot of older folks died of pneumococcal pneumonia. But for sure, flu vaccine, everybody, everybody flu vaccine. Let's talk a little bit about the vaccine that is coming. And let me tell you folks, we are extremely, extremely fortunate to have this vaccine. Let me deal with one other thing that we're very fortunate about. A lot of viruses, unfortunately, get into kids and can kill kids, including measles. Be sure to get your kid the measles vaccine. The anti-vaxxers, I just want to spend a few seconds on that. 
The original study was retracted that talked about autism and vaccine. Mm -hmm. It was retracted. The, the data was bull do dookie. It was not accurate. It was total wrong nonsense data. No connection between autism and childhood vaccines. Get your kids vaccinated. If they get measles, they can die. They get some of the other things you're vaccinating them for, they can die. Please get the vaccine for your childhood illnesses. And what about vaccine for COVID? Most vaccines, the, the, the shortest that I've heard took five years. So we are extremely lucky that we have a vaccine this quickly. And this vaccine is called an mRNA vaccine. And there's actually many different vaccines that are out there. The two that are gonna be FDA approved very shortly and they're already using them in the UK and other places. Uh, these vaccines have been shown to be extremely effective so you decrease your chances of getting sick from this virus and dying from this virus, 95%. That's unbelievably great. The vaccine is great. The vaccine has been around, I agree, it's not been around a long time. And people say, well, what about the long-term consequences? We don't know for sure what the long-term consequences are, but here's the data that we do know. Any vaccine that's been developed, when, and there's a bunch of them. We've had dozens of vaccines that we've used for, you know, for decades. And if there was a problem with a vaccine, it came up within the first 60 days of testing. These vaccines have been out 90, 120 days and more. So there have been no serious problems with this vaccine. So you, if you've got CKD, you have a serious problem of potentially dying from COVID. There is no serious problem reported from this vaccine, and it's highly, highly unlikely that there's going to be any problems with the vaccine going forward. But of course, it's going to be checked. And uh, the first people to get the vaccine are going to be the healthcare workers. And the second people to get the vaccine are going to be people in nursing homes. So many people that have died have been in nursing homes. Unfortunately, they didn't know in the beginning what they were doing. They were moving people uh, into the nursing homes to make space in the hospital. And unfortunately, a lot of old folks died. The risk of death is extremely high when you get in your 70s and 80s. The risk of death is extremely high for kidney disease patients. You've got kidney disease, your risk is high. If you are African American and you've got kidney disease, your risk is extremely high. And I understand that a higher percentage of African Americans are fearful of the vaccine. Do not be fearful of the vaccine. I know our country has a very bad history of testing drugs on African Americans. And, and I've been involved with, with uh, getting a drug to uh, uh, through the FDA as part of multi-center research studies. I know all about these studies. You cannot do a study today without having informed consent and having what they call an institutional review board make sure that the patients are being looked out for. And every single uh, vaccine that's being looked at is being looked at by many, many, many experts. They're not pushing it out. This is not just to make money. This is basically to save lives. So the vaccine is something that you all should consider if you've got kidney disease, especially Hispanic also. There's been a very, very high death rate in Hispanics and African-Americans that got COVID. Very, very high risk of death. Kidney disease, people with lung disease and heart disease and diabetes also have increased risk. But it turns out that kidney disease is an extremely important risk factor for, uh, for getting uh, a bad case of COVID and potentially uh, dying. Yeah, and I'd like to, you know, a couple questions came up that are related to this. So there are three different 
vaccines currently that are at the forefront that are very close, Pfizer, Madeira, and AstraZeneca. Can you talk about the differences between those? Right. Um, I think, so th there's actually, I think, something like 60 vaccines that are in mm -hmm. trials. And the vaccines that are going to be offered to you are going to be two shots. The vaccines, unfortunately, have to be kept at a very low temperature and, um, and they've got to be used quickly. And you've got to take two shots to make sure that you get enough of what we talked about earlier. Your body makes antibodies to the virus and kills the virus so you don't get sick. Um, the AstraZeneca is a more traditional uh, uh, type of, uh, I, and actually I'm not really familiar with their mechanism. I know that the, um, the mechanism for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine is so-called mRNA. So mRNA, people have asked me, I got a call today from someone out in California, a family member, and um, she said, my husband Jim wants to know whether I should take the vaccine because he's exposed to a lot of kids with autism. And those kids can't mask, and that's a really high-risk job. He's a mm -hmm. teacher. And he said, well, this is this mRNA, and I heard that mRNA is mRNA. We all have it. Every single one of us have billions and trillions of mRNA. These are normal parts of our body. They're just, you know, the things that make, you know, the, the if you heard of um, DNA, this is the, uh, the, the coding of our, all of our genes, all of our, who we are and what we're made of is, is based on mRNA and DNA. Um, the, the, there's lots of ways to, to give you something that are either going to be a part of a virus, an inactivated virus. The mRNA is just a really tiny piece of the mechanism of the virus and how it operates and how it attaches to your cells. But there's lots of other components to, to this virus that they've used to get your own body to make antibodies. And it's not just the antibodies. I'm not going to get into too, too much detail, but there's cellular components to your immunity. And all of that's going to be examined over the next few years in terms of, you know, what types of immunity you get, how long it's going to last. But there is one thing I want to be sure you understand. If you take the vaccine, we do not know yet if you can transmit the virus to someone else. So this will not be the end of masking. You're still going to have to mask. You will be safe. You can get on airplanes. You can travel. You're not going to get sick. You're not going to die of COVID. But we don't know yet whether you can theoretically transmit the virus, even though you can't get sick from it. So that's there are things that we're going to have to learn, and, and we're going to learn them in the next year. And likely, by next summer, everyone should have the option to get vaccinated. And as soon as the vaccine is available to you, I highly encourage you to take it. Oh, I'm getting it as soon as it's available to me. Same with my wife. And then once it's available for our kids, we're definitely getting them vaccinated. A couple good questions that came up. Barbara is asking, how soon after you tr you can you travel after getting vaccinated? Can you talk about the timing it takes for the two doses? I believe they're about three weeks apart. Two, I think it's two weeks. But um, all of this is information that I don't have yet. I mean, mm -hmm. the vaccine's not out yet. Um, my guess is by the time you get your second dose, you should be good to go. I don't know if they're going to recommend waiting a couple weeks. Uh, but, you know, I think that, um, that you should be good to go. But the problem is... Um, that if we can get enough people vaccinated, we can stop the spread of this virus. And that's the other reason to get vaccinated. You want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. If you don't yes. wear a mask, you're part of the problem. If you're refusing to vaccinate, you're part of the problem. As a society, if we get enough people with the vaccine, the virus is, can't spread anymore. We can't, we, we'll, we'll get the, we end the pandemic. Yeah, we, now, we pretty much cut yeah. off the host for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, James, exactly. Okay. And, you know, whether or not like the flu vaccine, we're going to have to take uh, another shot. We're not going to know that until they track 
what's going on with your own antibody responses, with your cellular immunity and all this other kind of stuff. So there's a lot we don't know about, and that was a great question. I mean, I would assume that within a couple of weeks of getting your second dose, you're probably good. To, you, I would think you're going to be good to go, but I don't have the, mm -hmm. I don't have the information yet. Yep. I have another question here. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and perhaps you have some insight on this. What if someone already had COVID-19, should they still get the vaccine when it's available? Yeah, I think the, I think they're going to recommend it. I think they're going to recommend that you get it because we don't know how long the immunity lasts from getting the virus. And I'm, I'm just, that's a good question, but I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, and, you know, because there, there have been cases, very few, where people have documented COVID and they got it a second time. Mm -hmm. So my guess is they're going to recommend it even for people that have already had it. But I don't have, I don't really have the actual correct answer to that. Good question. Yeah. And then um, one more thing I'd love for yeah, you just to yeah, reemphasize. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. A few people have questioned, uh, is it safe if they have stage four, if they have uh, stage three? Um, I know Moderna, which I've followed very, very closely. Um, I just, it, them and AstraZeneca are two companies I have a lot of interest in. So I've followed them very closely. I know Moderna has included people up to stage five in their testing so far. They've published that. Uh, but can you reemphasize the safety for those with kidney disease yeah. in case they didn't hear the, earlier? The, there's no reason to suspect that because you have kidney disease, that taking a vaccine is going to have any worse adverse effect than if you didn't have kidney disease. The main difference between people that have kidney disease or diabetes or have lung disease or have heart disease is that you are at a much higher risk of dying without the vaccine. So there's, there's no reason that your level of kidney function should in any way affect whether you get a bad outcome from the vaccine. Absolutely no reason at all. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the main, the people that are at the highest risk are people with the lowest kidney function. People on dialysis are at extremely high risk. Mm -hmm. Transplant patient patients are at an extremely high risk. And so all of these folks, as far as I know, there has been suggestion that the vaccine is going to be good for all of these groups of people across the board, all levels of kidney function, dialysis and transplant patients. It should be available for all of you. And the higher your risk, the quicker you better shuffle off to put your arm out and say, stick me yeah. with that vaccine, stick me twice, you know. You yeah, do come to it. Make <laughs> sure you come back for that second dose, everyone. And the timing is very, very important from what I've read. Um, you can't just get the first dose and decide, yeah, I'll go back in two months and get the second dose. Whatever they tell you, when they say come back on this date, make sure you do that so that you are protected. And those of you out there who have a transplant, you are at much greater risk of catching COVID because you're taking those immune suppressants. So make sure when it's available, get the vaccine, protect yourself. There was some question about this is so confusing because the place where the virus attaches is called the ACE receptor. And remember, we talked about <laughs> ACEs and ARBs, important yes. drugs, read my book, ACEs and ARBs are extremely important for kidney patients, especially if you got protein in the urine, they may save you from getting kidney failure. But people say, well, ACEs and ARBs, should I stop my blood pressure medicine because it's going to affect whether COVID can attach because I'm blocking the ACE or no, no problem. Continue your blood pressure medicines. And I've got some other thing that I'm doing. I've listened to a lot of discussions about it. I generally am not somebody that believes in vitamins. I don't think, I think vitamins are good for the people that make them. Most of the time, if you eat a reasonably healthy diet and most of us Americans 
are get, get plenty of vitamins in our diet, unless we eat a weird diet, you probably don't need to take vitamin pills. But there is a vitamin that kidney patients have been taking for a long time uh, that has to do with the bone disease of kidneys called <laughs> vitamin D. Yes. And believe it or not, yours truly, after listening to a couple of very convincing, I mean, it's not 100%, it's not like we got big randomized controlled trials like they're doing with the vaccine. These mm -hmm. vaccines go through such amazingly strict randomized controlled trials to get them to be out there for you to take. But we can't have that kind of stuff with vitamin D. But there's a lot of suggestive data that says taking 5,000 units of 125, the vitamin D that we need to take if you got kidney disease, because if your kidneys aren't good, you're not gonna get that 125, because part of the activation of vitamin D to get the 125, 25, the 25 part happens in the liver, the one part happens in the kidneys. And with kidney disease, it doesn't work so good. So you can take that 125 vitamin D, 5,000 units a day, should be safe, unless you've already got high calcium levels, which is unlikely for most kidney patients, um, 5,000 units of vitamin D may protect you, may protect you, yeah. Now, uh, a lot of young people say, well, I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna be immune, but there are things, there is a group of people called the long haulers. I don't know if you heard about that, James. Oh, I have, and, and, and there's also, the ones we don't know what happens those who get it now six months from now 12 months from now two years from now are there going to be lung issues so that whole already, the whole i'm just going to get it oh that just upsets me i feel well, bad james, for those people james we've accumulated enough data because we've had millions of people already getting this virus mm -hmm. we've accumulated enough data to know that somewhere between 20 to 50% of people have some long-term problem with this after getting COVID. Things like brain fog, things like persistent cough, things like decreased lung function, things like problems with your heart, things like problems with your kidneys. Every system of the body has shown potential bad effects after having COVID. This is not like, you know, a co common cold. This is a serious, very, very easily transmitted disease that can have long-term effects. So you need to protect yourself. Wear those masks. Have everybody around you wear those masks. Social distance, and the social distance, six feet, they say, well, Okay, the, the reason for the six feet is, okay, you got the droplets coming out, how far can they travel? If James is six feet away or if he's eight feet away, the further away you are from people, when you go into stores, stay back. Don't get on top of people. Try to keep at least six feet away from the person in front of you so that whatever's coming out of them or whatever's coming out of you, it's not going to cause an infection. And if you are one of the very high-risk people, again, lower kidney function, African-American, Hispanic, older folk, get somebody else to do your chores, go to the pharmacy, go to the store for you. If you have food delivered, let them leave it outside yeah. your door, decant it into stuff that you want to eat from, and, and you're good, you know. Stay out of the restaurants, certainly stay out of the bars, stay out of clubs, <sighs> stay out of arenas. Outdoor activities is going to be what you need for mental health. And those folks uh, who are thinking about getting pregnant, my daughter uh, had her, uh, my last uh, grandchild was in, uh, well actually I, <laughs> I, I had my stepdaughter had twins and my, my, uh, my daughter had a baby uh, in, under the COVID thing. It's no fun to have to go to the hospital oh. by yourself. You don't get people coming to Guga and Gaga around the baby. Look, you want to have a baby, if you can, postpone it till you get your vaccine, till this thing is behind us. By next summer, should be behind us. Certainly, 
you know, 2021, I think by the end of 2021, this thing will be behind us. And next holiday, God willing, we're going to all be able to see our grandkids, see our families, <laughs> celebrate, hug. You know, we'll be we'll be back to normal. But you got to be patient. And I know I know you've got COVID fatigue, but try to, you know, <laughs> stick stick it out, stick with it. It's going to yep. end. The end is in sight. Well, and when you were talking about the mask, uh, a few moments ago, I grabbed my outdoor mask. I u- I actually use a different mask. This one happens to be made by Under Armour. I couldn't remember <laughs> whose logo this is. I love, this is actually designed for people who run or jog. It's got wow. support all the way around it. You know, there's the, the wire isn't just here. It goes everywhere around it. And it has a huge gap in there wow. for your nose and your mouth mm. so you can talk. And it's super, super thick. It's several layers. It's very mm. foamy in there. It's cool. super comfortable for going outside wearing this. Um, a while back, I did go to an event. It was a social distance event. And I wore this one because it's a lot more comfortable. I'm not touching it and adjusting it. Where these more flexible, thinner ones, you tend to adjust them. And they don't fit as tight. They just got a little bit of a a nose piece that's all in there. So, well, you know, yeah, anyone having I, trouble, try a different mask. You got to don't go without. Find one you yes. like. And and the actually these are uncomfortable. These these KN95s you itch and so forth. You, you all, again, two layers of cloth mm-hmm. is what you need to keep yourself protected from incoming virus or outgoing virus. So and, and those are more breathable, you know. Um we got some more questions? Yeah, oh, let me see. see. Oh, and also, going outside is great. I yeah. love now walking in the evening. There's oh, yeah. nobody out there. I mm-hmm. go out with the flashlight. I do my walk. I'm getting some outside, getting some fresh air. Mm-hmm. And I may, I've done it a few times early in the morning, though I prefer to sleep in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of the, <laughs> let me sleep in. Let me tell you, when we all get to go back to work, oh, there's going to be a, a, quite an adjustment yeah. to not get up half an hour before a meeting <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah. yeah <laughs> when I have yeah. to drive. So let me see. Oh, someone's asking for the name of your book right here. It is on the screen, Beverly. The book is Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. And there's a website right there. I got a short URL. If you go to go dadvicetv.com slash book that will take you straight to amazon to that book so you can find it it's also great to go to your local bookstore or call them don't go there call them up and ask them hey do you carry this or can you guys order it that makes them aware that hey you know maybe we need to stock some more books about kidney disease because every bookstore i've ever walked into back before covid when i was going to stores I never found a single kidney book there. I had to order them all online. So let well, me and, see what. And, and yeah, yeah, and we, we should we should we should definitely go to our local stores. I mean, the local Amazon's doing great. If you can possibly, they will you know, always do great. Book, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially under COVID. So try to, if you can, safely use your local stores. Do it, mm-hmm. but try to do yeah. it safely. Get someone else to run out to the store. If you're a high risk patient, let me just touch on schools and kids. Yeah, go Luckily, ahead. Luckily, as I told you, this, I, maybe I didn't, I don't think I got to finish it. <clears throat> a lot of viruses can kill kids. This virus, luckily, kids, at least elementary school kids, seem to get by very well. They, they are not transmitting it. It's not like they're absolutely, you know, not going to give anybody the virus, but Kids should go to school. It's important. The schools know how to protect the teachers. How, and the kids, it's amazing. Kids are just so adaptable. They wear their masks. They know how to stay away from each other. I mean, it's just, it's so nice to watch. But kids are okay. Kids are, are probably not going to give you the virus. Uh, most of the time, kids are getting the virus from their home environment. Most of the virus that's being transmitted in public schools is coming from at home to people that are coming to work. Um, and look, we don't have all the information now, but elementary school seems to be 
something that is so important that we should encourage our local schools to try to get our kids going. Do it safely. A couple of days in school, a couple of days, you know, on, on Zoom or whatever, if they have it, that's, that's a reasonable way to go. High school, middle school, college, different story. Yeah, they're these changing kids, classes we, and the yeah, halls yeah, are crowded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. these kids um, can certainly get sick. Higher, and, and as you get older, the likelihood of, of, of having a bad outcome increases. And a lot of these young folks, like I said, they may wind up being long haulers. They may, a lot of them have asymptomatic infection, mm -hmm. but some of them may wind up being long haulers. So I would not think that just because you're a younger person that you don't have to worry about this and get the vaccine because you want to be part of the solution. You want to be part of this so-called bad term that you've heard immunity. People say, well, we don't want to be considered to be cattle. But what it means is basically if you got enough people that get the vaccine, mm -hmm. the virus will have nobody to jump onto yep. and you're, continue you're, to spread you're it out. removing the host. It can't yeah. keep reproducing and spreading. We have a couple comments here and a couple questions. Beverly said, I'd rather wear a mask than a ventilator. So true. Great. When, when I'm out, I say mask it or casket. I know it's a little gloomy, yeah. but that's the what I say. <laughs> that makes a point. I like it. When I walk I like in it, James. I like and it. I see that person out mm -hmm. somewhere, which I don't go out very often, and they're doing this, which oh, yeah. is useless, yeah. <laughs> I tell hey, Mask it or casket. You you make your own decision. Come on, and, let's put the and, mask on. And, you protect everyone. Don't think of just yourself. And, and someone actually mentioned the horrible way that people have been dying in COVID mm -hmm. alone, oh, alone yes. with this horrible thing where you can't breathe. It is a miserable, horrible way to die. You don't want to wish it on anybody. Please protect yourself and protect everybody else around you. Yep. And we had someone asking what the symptoms of COVID are we actually covered those earlier um do you want to yeah. briefly go back over those real quick yeah. for them you're running you're running a fever you got a persistent cough you lose your sense of smell things aren't smelling right you lose your sense of taste but you can have a lot of covid patients do get gi symptoms you can get diarrhea you can get stomach upset so it could look like an intestinal bug it could look like a sore throat it could look like a usual covid fever so under the pandemic if you've got any of this stuff you're kind of obliged to try to, you know, isolate, try not to give anybody whatever you've got and try to get a COVID test as soon as you, well, let's say within a few days of, of the onset of symptoms, I would say three or four days, certainly by five days, the test should be positive. Mm -hmm. If you have it. If you have it, right. If you do actually have it. And then one of our regulars, Jane and Bill asked, if you have CKD, is there, you know, do you know, is there a way to ask your doctor to put you on a special priority list since that I is a know. high risk Good person? Good question. Good question. Jane. Yeah, but that's deal. always in the back of my mind. <laughs> right. So what's going to happen is that there's going to be uh, national recommendations, but every state is going to have their health department decide just how they want to distribute the vaccine. So it's going to be up to your local uh, health department. And you might want to uh, advocate for kidney patients and and hopefully they will get the study that showed, this was out of the UK, it, it was 2 million people, and, and they were the ones who came up with the fact that there is a graded risk as you get lower kidney function. So they should, you, people with kidney function, especially if you're African American or Hispanic, uh, people with decreased kidney function, that and diabetes, I think you should be you know, top of the risk, but they're not going to, I don't think they're going to do it by, you know, combination of diagnosis. They're going to be, you know, the uh, central workers, they're going to be the nursing home people. There's a lot of different groups of people and it's going to be a tough thing to figure out, but you will eventually get it. And if you got to wait a couple of months and you got to be safe for a couple of months, just think about it safe, but you'll be alive for next year. It'll be yep. behind you. And, and we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train. It, we know, there is a great future where we're going to get this behind us. We're going to get it under control and it's worth hunkering down for a few more months. If that's all you got to do to get passes. Can you also re clarify um, about the ARB and the ACE and how they're COVID attaches? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're fine. They're fine to use. They're fine to use. Yeah. But the, you know, the receptor, the COVID receptor has been studied all kinds of different ways. 
and there's lots of uh, attempts to get various vaccines. And by the way, there will be a one-dose vaccine. So just because you're not at the head of the line, you may be, you know, six months from now, there may be the one-dose vaccine that's coming. I think the AZ, AstraZeneca may be a one-doser. Yeah, I believe that one sure. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's going to be others behind it that may be the one-dose vaccines. So, look, there's a lot of vaccines out there. I think the fact that we've shown the vaccines work and there's going to be more vaccines that are going to work and we're going to have good ways to keep keep ourselves safe. Yep. All right. Let's ask one last time. Anybody out there got any questions? We're right at the top of the hour. You got, you know, Dr. Rose here. Uh, he won't be back for two more weeks. So there's a great <laughs> opportunity if you have a question to ask it. <laughs> I'm looking to see what people are saying. Now, some people did comment. Um, you know, Candy had mentioned a lot of hospitals are setting up tablets like iPads for people to say goodbye to their family. And that is so sad. But even with the, you know, having someone there on video, if you're alone and it's the end of your life, um, you know, you don't want that to happen to you or to someone you know. So make sure you guys, you know, wear the mask, social distance, wash, avoid the crowds. Don't, don't go to any bars. Come on. We don't need those for right now. If you, if you want to drink, somehow get it delivered to your house and do it at home. <laughs> All right. Well, we get a lot of hands away from your face and your nose. Wash yes. your hands. Get away from your face and your nose. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and all, earlier you had mentioned about sanitizer. I carry sanitizer. Yeah. And if I go somewhere, I sanitize when I get back in the car. And my doctor recommended taking, because they're very affordable and easy to get, some baby wipes with me yeah. and wiping down baby wipes, you know, mm -hmm. while I'm in the store, if I want to wipe down the cart, just wipe it down with a baby cart or a baby wipe. And then I use the sanitizer when I'm done mm -hmm. shopping. That way I don't have to worry about my skin drying out. And yeah. it's kind of a one way to help the sanitizer stretch. Mm -hmm. And I'm not absorbing all that alcohol into my body or whatever is in there. I don't like putting extra chemicals on my body. Uh, let's see. Uh, Deb asked, oh, okay, this is not related to COVID, but this is a great question for kidney patients. Is it normal? Whoops, yeah, there it is. Is it normal for your EGFR to drop with age? Yes, yes. And and if, if you, uh, I've done a show, I uh, can't remember when it was done, a couple of weeks back. There is a age-related decline of kidney function after the age of 40, uh, you're probably going to be losing about uh, 10 units of kidney function every decade. So just like with other parts of your body, your brain, unfortunately, we lose brain cells, we lose muscle cells, we do lose kidney units with age. Absolutely. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you so much again, Dr. Rowe. This has been fantastic and so informative and it's timely. And I want to encourage everyone out there, stay home, avoid the crowds, uh, wear your mask when you're out and about. If you don't have one you like, you know, there's great reviews, lots of different kinds online that you can get. Um, these little silicone inserts are very affordable. If the, if you have trouble with the mask touching your face, um, Wash your hands, be safe. And Dr. Rowe and I will be back in two weeks. I will be back tomorrow night with Jen Hernandez. And we are, I can't remember what we're talking about, but we're talking about something good. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks again, Dr. Rowe. And thanks everybody out there. We'll see you in the next video. Bye everyone. <laughs>